thanks to the Atlantic Salmon Trust for the opportunity to come here today and uh, introduce in an oceanographic context the, uh, the Atlantic Ocean, the, the habitat for all these salmon. And it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I got some help with this talk, I didn't write it on my own. Uh, I got some very nice help from a colleague in the Institute of Marine Research in Norway, Jill Arna Mork, who worked extensively as one of the few oceanographers on the South Sea project. I also had some input from Chalmer Hattun from the Fair Louise Fisheries Lab, and also, believe it or not, from the European Space Agency. So even space people are thinking about salmon and the Atlantic uh, circulation. So what I'd like to break this talk into two pieces. The first is to talk about the variability in the North Atlantic Ocean, explain a little bit about how the circulation works, uh, the different gyres, the subpolar and subtropical gyres, these circular circulation mechanisms that are there, a cold blob of water that we've observed there in the last uh, couple of years, talk a little bit about fresh water in the Atlantic, uh, very briefly look at ice and the ice that is at the edges of the Atlantic Ocean, so to speak, and briefly mention the oceanographic findings from the South Sea program, and then on the latter part of the talk I'll just introduce some promising technologies that I feel are going to be uh, important in future observations of the ocean. So this is a map of where smolts were caught in the Atlantic as part of the South Sea program. Uh, and what we want to do as oceanographers is understand why this distribution of smolts is as it is. So what I'll do is just walk you through some of the different uh, circulation elements in the Atlantic and then maybe try and put it in the context of these smolts that have been caught uh, as part of South Sea. So this is a, an idealized uh, Atlantic circulation. You've probably seen maps like this before with very uh, well-defined current pathways, the Gulf Stream, which you'll be familiar with. But in practice, the Atlantic Ocean doesn't work like this. It actually works more like this. It's a complex interaction of eddies. So you're looking at the same Gulf Stream, but it's no longer just a single line going from America to Europe. It's a very, very complex uh, circulation structure. You can see the warm, salty water from the Florida Straits uh, making its way across the Atlantic Ocean. So we can't very easily just go to a particular place and measure the North Atlantic current. It's a very diffuse, very complex uh, current. And trying to understand this is, is an incredible challenge. Uh, the technology we use to do it and the frequency with which we have to observe the Atlantic Ocean. The other thing that's very important in the circulation in the Atlantic, I know it's a very detailed plot, but I just want to highlight in the lower left-hand corner a phenomenon called the North Atlantic Oscillation. This basically dictates how strong the westerly winds are over the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a weather system like, like, you, like you would see on your weather chart. You have the Azores High, as they call it, and the Icelandic Low, so a high and a low pressure system. And air flows in a certain way around these two systems. And in this situation, what they call a very positive North Atlantic Oscillation situation, you have very strong westerly winds. So that pushes water from the US or the mid-Atlantic towards Europe. And there are three other states as well, which I won't go into, but I just want you to keep in the back of your mind this, this uh, phenomenon of very enhanced westerly winds under what we call the positive North Atlantic Oscillation. I'll come back to that later in the talk. The other thing to say about the Atlantic is that there is a natural cycle in the Atlantic Ocean. So this is a data set that goes back to the 1850s, and you can see a warm period at the start, followed by a cold period, another warm period, a cold period, and a warm period again. So this is sea surface temperature and how it changes over 150 years. They've also gone back and looked over a more extended period of time by inferring from tree rings, uh, the, the warm and cold periods. And again, you can see over a longer period from the late uh, 16th century, all the way across these warm, cold, warm, cold, cycles. They're not always the same length. It's not very uh, synchronous. Uh, it, it sometimes it's 70 years cold and 40 years warm. It depends. But this is important to remember that this is here as natural variability in the Atlantic Ocean, naturally changing. On top of that, however, you do have a, a global warming, an anthropogenic man-made uh, signal to this. So this is the temperature, sea surface temperature from the last IPCC report from 1900 through to about 2010. This is uh, latitude on the, the axis here, so we're going from 30 degrees south, south of the equator, the equator here, and then up to the northern latitudes. And we're, we're around about here, 50, 52, 53 degrees north. And you can see this pronounced warming that's taken place over the 100 years. 
So that, 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 is over, that is superimposed on the natural cycle that I showed you in the previous slides. So I want to now introduce the idea of the subpolar gyre. This is a, a, a circulation pattern. Uh, I might just bring up the Labrador Sea where cold fresh water is uh, very prominent and prevalent. And the wind mixes this cold fresh water down in the ocean and then it leaves the Labrador Sea and it makes its way around what they call the subpolar gyre. So you may or may not have heard of this term before. You also have a subtropical gyre, which goes in the opposite sense. It uh, leaves the coast of the US at Cape Hatteras uh, in that very uh, complicated structure that I showed earlier on. And then it goes across to Europe and then loops around the Iberian Peninsula, comes back towards the equator and back towards the, the US again. And in between the two of these is the North Atlantic Current, or the Gulf Stream, or the Drift are, are the terms uh, commonly used. So the North Atlantic Current is the the boundary between the subpolar gyre and the subtropical gyre. The water in the subpolar gyre, as you might expect, is fresh and cold. The water in the subtropical gyre is warm and salty. And the North Atlantic Current has branches that have cold and fresh uh, parts and warm and salty parts. So this gyre is very important. And I'm going to talk a little bit how this changes. Again, just to go back to the complexity, please don't try to memorize anything on this graph. It's, it's very, very complicated. This is a picture from satellites at the height of the sea surface, uh, and it's at the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it's over a period of time, over several years. And what you can see is that the Gulf Stream, you know, branches into different uh, sub-branches. You can see here, for example, it splits in two. So you can see a north-flowing branch and a south-flowing branch. So again, the Gulf Stream, it isn't this just very simple uh, current that flows from, from west to east. It's a very, very complicated thing, and measuring and monitoring this is very tricky. So I just want to mention about how the uh, subpolar gyre has changed in the last couple of years. Um, if you went back 10 or 15 years ago, the blue line would signify the, the extent, the spatial extent of that subpolar gyre. And when the gyre is over to the west, if you like, in this situation, it allows warm salty water to also flow from southern Europe to northern Europe. So all of this entire red area can fill up with warm salty water. But as the gyre expands, the area of warm water contracts because there's a competition between the, the subpolar gyre and the water that comes from the south. And in about 2009, this is what it looked like the subpolar gyre had made some progress towards Europe. And by 2015, it looked something like this. So the warm water is very much hemmed in against the European margin here. And this, as Ken and others will show, is a key migration route for salmon. So how, how, how strong this current flowing from south to north is along the European margin is very, very important. This is the cold blob that I mentioned in the introduction. This is a, a sea surface. It's both land and ocean, so it's a combined uh, temperature map. But I hope you can see in the North Atlantic Ocean, pretty much everywhere else in the world, ocean and over the land masses is, is warmer. This is uh, a composite of January to August 2015. We have this prevalent cold spot in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. It isn't just at the surface, it also manifests itself at, at depth. Uh, I won't go into that level of detail here. But uh, my colleague, Chandra Hatun, believes that this cold blob is good for ecosystems because a lot of uh, fish and plankton and so on really like cold water. They have a preference for it over, over warmer water. This is the evolution of the cold blob over the uh, season, if you like, from uh, the winter going from 14 into 15. This is the springtime the summertime, and again in the autumn. And this feature persists into 2016 and 17, so it sets up for a couple of years. We don't really know how it got there. We know there were some very cold winters in uh, 10 into 11 and 9 into 10, um, and that probably has something to do with this cold blob, but it's very, very important in influencing uh, weather and climate over, over Europe, and it's actually associated with heat, heat waves in some cases. And this is it over several years, so this is from 2010, and this panel, no cold blob, back to 2015 when there's a substantial cold blob. It's not a very elegant term, I'm afraid, but oceanographers aren't the most imaginative of people when it comes to naming things. The other thing to say about the subpolar gyre is, I mentioned that the water in the subpolar gyre is relatively cold and relatively uh, fresh. So if you look at the salinity, the saltiness of the water, you can actually see in recent years this decline. This is from a, an area at the Faroe Islands. You can see a very, very strong decline in the salinity, the saltiness of the, uh, the, sub, of the area that's, man, that's uh, 
uh, influenced by the subpolar gyre. So this uh, salinity anomaly, we've seen these in the 80s and in the 90s, and this is a, a very large one uh, around 2016. So we're, we're interested to see how this evolves over time. So and you can see the previous events here as well. So the other thing to say is that these uh, major scale changes, this is the gyre index, it's an index to measure the strength of the gyre, the subpolar gyre. You can see how it changes over time between 1992 and 2010. Um, the various cold events, primary production, the amount of phytoplankton in the water is synced with the gyre, as is zooplankton production, in this case in Iceland, as is the abundance <coughs> of sand eels, as are kitty wakes and their breeding success, and cod growth. So these are things that have been linked together. So you can see that these things are synced. So this, we have now many, many satellites. Uh, some people call them space junk. Uh, they, they orbit the Earth. Uh, they take many, many pictures. The nice thing about having all these satellites is you can get very, very up-to-date images of the sea ice extent, uh, which typically <coughs> shows its maximum in March time and its minimum in September. So this is just an example from 2012. Uh, I don't know how sea ice impacts on salmon migration. I know in the, in the previous uh, introduction, Tarpon mentioned that the Russians didn't feel that the salmon uh, were in close proximity to the ice, but I guess it's, a, it's, it's an unknown as well. So having this very high resolution information on ice is, is important, uh, just in an oceanographic context, because the less ice that's there, the more heat is absorbed in the Arctic Ocean that then perturbs the different currents in the Atlantic and so on. And this is just an image from a couple of days ago. Uh, so this is from uh, you know, four, three, four days ago. And again, it's, it's quite similar to the, to the, uh, the winter picture that you see. So there, there hasn't really been very extensive melting of, of the sea ice yet. But these are very, very nice products to have available so that we can monitor this on a continuous basis. So back to the smolts, because uh, most of you came here to talk about salmon. These are the distributions of the smolts. We have the warm inflow from the Atlantic Ocean up along the Norwegian coast. We also have another complication of a coastal current along the coast of Norway. And we have the return flows of cold water from the Nordic seas that come back down into Iceland and the Norwegian basin. And what do we know about smolts? We know from previous research that they, they typically occupy the surface layer. They have a preference for temperatures between 8 and 12 degrees Celsius and they like salinities higher than 35. So we, we know this from many previous studies. We also know that they move northward with the currents, uh, possibly to minimize the amount of energy they have to expend along their, along their path. And one of the things we can do is we can use ocean forecast models. So this is looking from 1996 to 2010. These are the speeds of the surface currents. Uh, so that's about uh, a half a knot for people who, who work in, in uh, in, in, in imperial, so to speak, and the migration speed then is a little bit faster than the surface currents. So this suggests that salmon take some benefit from the surface current, but they also actively swim as well. So they don't just lie back and, and let the currents carry them along. They, they actively swim and feed, and I, I leave the salmon biologist to tell you, tell you more about that. So what we want to try and do is understand how the, uh, the distributions that are found in, in the catches, how they relate to uh, some of the uh, models that we use, we can use ocean forecast models, ocean simulation models to try to predict where salmon will go and how they'll behave in the future. So I just have two years here, 2002 and 2008, and I'll bring you back to the idea of this North Atlantic Oscillation. Strong North Atlantic Oscillation, very strong westerly winds, that was the case in 2002. And in 2008, the North Atlantic Oscillation was, was quite weak, so there weren't, there weren't strong westerly winds, the, the wind fields were quite diverse uh, over, over, over that time. And you can see the progression, so what we've done here is we've released, in a model, we've released salmon smolts, effectively, or particles, uh, and we, we allow the wind and the tides and the North Atlantic Current and the subpolar gyre and all these phenomena to act on this patch of particles and move them around, so it's forced with the real world conditions. We use the real world wind conditions to figure out uh, where the smolts would go. And you can see when the strong westerly winds, you get uh, the smolts are hemmed up against the Norwegian coast. So the westerly winds and the surface currents push the smolts towards the Norwegian coast. But in 2008, it's a much more diffuse picture. And the survival, Ken will talk about this later, the survival was much, much better in 2002 than it was in 2008. 
So this is a clear indication that the winds have a major effect on, on salmon distribution and their, the, the way that they migrate. If you try to summarize that in 2002, you have a much narrower, well-defined migration path here and a much more diffuse one in 2008. And as I say, this is down to the strong westerly winds in one year versus very weak westerly winds in the other. The other thing we can do very easily with ocean models and satellites is we can, we can develop maps of optimal salinity. So we know that salmon like salinity in excess of 35. We know they like a particular thermal or temperature preference. We can make maps of where you encounter these types of conditions and then we can look at where the smolts uh, may be based on that as well. So just to summarize this part of the discussion, the ocean currents can transport and guide the pulse smolts towards areas with favorable feeding. Uh, in some areas, the direction of migration is sensitive to those changes in winds that I mentioned in the previous couple of slides. And we know the temperature and salinity can be important uh, in terms of their swimming preferences as well and the direction in which they swim. So in the last part of this talk, I would just like to talk about future technologies just to give a flavor of some of the future technologies uh, that can monitor the physical environment in which salmon live. So I want to talk about briefly about an end-to-end -end oceanographic system. You have all these different technologies, and I'll go into more detail on them in a minute. These comprise what we call the in-situ system, the, the, the physical technology in the sea that measures things. We also use models, forecast models like they use for the weather. We also have them for the ocean. We use satellite products extensively, as I mentioned. We need to archive these. These generate huge terabytes of data, really large data sets. We need to archive them. We also need to be able to interrogate these archives. And if we do all that right, we can have some answers. We can have some uh, decision support, if you like. We can make management decisions based on all of these pieces of this jigsaw. So these are some of the technologies that are involved. You have research vessels, satellites that orbit over our heads. We have coastal stations that measure uh, the tide or the temperature, offshore buoys or buoys for the people from North America, uh, drifters, profilers, gliders, these are autonomous vehicles that can go out for six or eight weeks at a time on their own, put the batteries in and let them go, uh, and then worry about them every minute they're gone because they're very expensive. Uh, and uh, landers on the seabed that we can, we can just sit on the seabed and measure things and send the information using a cable back to shore. These are just some, some of the uh, things that we can use. The other thing to be aware of, and I won't dwell on this, is that we also have under the global ocean observing system what we call essential ocean variables. These are things we must measure to understand the planet. We need to do this for, in, this is just for the ocean. We need to do it for the physical state, things like sea state, waves, currents, temperature. We need to do it for biogeochemistry, things like oxygen, uh, you know, particulate matter. And we need to do it for all these different biological areas. And the key thing here is that anything color-coded in that brown color means that we don't really have the technology to do this well and do it systematically now. So we need to build a system that allows us to do these things in the future. But I don't really want to dwell on that. I mentioned the space junk, uh, some people call it. These, this is the evolution of satellites uh, from the European Space Agency from 2000 to 2030. And you can see an ever increasing amount of satellites. These are what they call the Sentinel satellites. They measure things like uh, ocean salinity, temperature, color, surface winds, surface currents, many, many different things. And they have an evolution plan for these over the next 30 years, as I say, with an ever-increasing array of sensors and satellites. These are incredibly important for anything that happens on the surface of the ocean. I just want to show you a quick uh, movie here, if I can, if I can find it. Uh, on the basis that oceanographers, like myself, we apply for ship time from national funding mechanisms. And we typically get between 10 and 20 days a year on a national research vessel. This is a plot of all of the fishing vessels in Irish waters. A colleague in the Marine Institute in Galway provided this. It's color-coded by country, uh, with Ireland very patriotically in green. I hope you can make out the green. Uh, let me try and play that again. Um, uh, but you can see the various dots moving around. The point here is that Fishermen are out there all the time. They're out there every day. If you watch this all the way through, the Spanish stay out over Christmas and take a three-day break in New Year. The French go home at Christmas and come back out at New Year. These guys are there 362 days a year, and really 365 when you overlap everything. So these guys are here all the time, so why not turn them into opportunistic oceanographers? Why not get them to collect the information for us? Uh, I'll just go back to the slideshow. Uh, and show you some of the ideas we have in that regard. 
This is a system that we use to gather temperature and salinity data from a fishing vessel. It's an example from colleagues in France. So they have a sensor system that goes on the nets. Uh, when the nets come back on deck, it makes a profile down to the seabed and back up, gathers information on temperature and salinity, sends the information back to a computer on the bridge, and once this boat is in range of the mobile phone uh, network on the coast, it then sends the information back to base. Then oceanographers can analyze this information, but they could get it from 100 different vessels, turn it into maps, send these maps back out to the fishermen. They can be more efficient in how they catch fish. They use less uh, fuel. Uh, I don't know how people feel about that, but that's, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what we do here. Uh, this is just how they do it in, in Italy, where they make it into maps and they send the information back out from uh, the data center back to the fishing vessels. These are gliders, uh, these autonomous vehicles that I mentioned. I guess the key thing to say is that this is an idealized mission. It's an autonomous vehicle that, as I say, can go out for several weeks or months at a time. Uh, in true American style, they've now coined the term stretch glider, which like stretch limo, which is longer and you can put more batteries in to make it stay out longer in the ocean. Uh, so what they wanted to do here was send the glider from New Jersey to Spain. This is the idealized route. This is what happened in practice. Uh, the eddies and the various things that I showed you in one of the first slides, they govern the track that the glider takes. Because they can't steer very well through eddies and things like that. So they, uh, and they had to re battery this glider several times. They had to fly to the Azores, put more batteries in, get it the rest of the way to, to Spain. So the plan was a 5,500 kilometer mission that ended up being 7,400. Notwithstanding that, you can equip these gliders with many different sensors. They go down to 1,000 meters, they gather information on many, many different parameters in the ocean, and these are a really, really promising uh, technology that can be used in the future. Also, wave gliders, another uh, same idea, except these have a surface manifestation with an antenna that sends the information back to the shore, and they have a, 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 a payload, if you like, down on the bottom that also has sensors on it that's connected to the surface there, so they can be used. We also have kayaks. This is a conventional kayak that's been turned into a mini oceanographic ship equipped with sensors. These are the gentlemen who are uh, steering the glider, so they have a PlayStation controller like your kids or grandkids might have. An eight-year-old would probably be very skilled at driving this kayak, I'd imagine, based on uh, my experience at least. Uh, so they control this from the shore, they drive it around the bay, they collect oceanographic data without getting their feet wet, more or less. So this is again a promising technology. There are many uh, opportunities to cable the seafloor. This is a, a telecoms cable that runs out around the Juan de Fuca plate off Canada. Uh, very, very expensive, 80, 90 million dollar system, but there is effectively broadband at all of the points on this, on this map, at all of the nodes on this map. So we can bring high definition video, uh, camera images, we can, you can put very advanced analyzers <coughs> on the seabed. This is where the science is going. You can also do it in a very coastal context. This is a four kilometer long cable in Galway Bay in Ireland. Uh, running out to a test site. The salmon actually track along this shore. So there's no reason in the world why we couldn't have receivers here to detect the salmon, the smolts flowing or running out of the bay at different times of the year and running back. There are also lighthouses. We could potentially use lighthouses. Uh, we have about five oceanographic buoys off the coast of Ireland. There's about 180 navigation aids around the coast. Can we use some of these navigation aids to make oceanographic measurements? And here's a cartoon depiction of exactly that. A cardinal boy, a south cardinal boy that you'd see when you sail your boat, uh, but equipped with lots of different sensors and sending that information back to shore, putting it out on Twitter in real time and so on. The other thing that's a trend is low cost technology. So this is a web, a web camera here that's uh, 50 euros to buy, a, a mini computer, a Raspberry Pi computer, which you may have heard of, about $35. You put that on a, a buoy system with solar panels and telemetry. Uh, and you send this information to a scientific user. So in this case, it's sending images from the camera uh, in the middle of the Indian Ocean to the Zoological Society in London in near real time using Iridium telemetry. This is about 2,000 euros. Not a conventional oceanographic buoy is 200,000 euros. So this is, this, this is a game changer. Uh, one of my colleagues in the UK called this frugal innovation. I think it's a very good term. Uh, and as I say, the Zoological Society make use of this. The other thing to say is that there are many maritime uh, vessels out there. This is about 500 vessels just in this screenshot here. Can we put sensors on some of these vessels? Some of the shipping companies are very interested in having science bays on their vessels so that they can demonstrate good corporate citizenship and green PR and so on. So there, there are many opportunities here. 
There will be lots of things around DNA, isotopes, uh, tags and cameras, but they will be mainly covered by other people. And I can foresee a time, this isn't that far away, this already happens for plankton, where material swims by a buoy at sea and it detects the genetic material as, as the plankton and that swim by the, these ecogenomic sensors, sends the information back to shore in near real time. You get this fantastic genomic, genetic picture of uh, what happens in the ocean in real time. And the last thing I want to say, because I know John will talk about this in more detail, is this very friendly seal actually has a temperature and salinity tag on his, on his coat, if that's the correct term, pelt or coat, I'm not sure. Uh, but the nice thing about seals, uh, if you can manage to get one of these sensors onto them, is that they go to places that ocean hunters typically can't go. So they go under, under the ice in Antarctica, they're up in the Arctic regions, so can we use these guys as oceanographers as well? We already do that, we already collect a lot of information, but can we make the tags smaller? Can we make them measure more things? So in the future we might have a, a film set on the, on, the, on the seabed with lights and robotic arms and high definition cameras, all cabled back to shore by a fibre optic cable. These are some of the inspiring ideas that John Delaney from the University of Washington in Seattle uh, has uh, shown. So th this is potentially the future. So with that, I'd like to end and thank you again very much for the session.